Selamat pagi semua menuju siang. Okay, my name is uh, Peter Kim, um, and our family had been serving in Indonesia uh, amongst the Sundanese, uh, one of the largest, actually, the largest unreached people groups of uh, Indonesia, where Indonesia is mostly uh, Muslim. And when we first started uh, 18 years ago, um, the gospel rate of Sun amongst the Sundanese was 0.07%, so it's not even 0.1%. But now, you know, we're glad to say that the, it, the number has moved up about 700%, yet it's still a very small amount. It, the, it's still zero point, it doesn't go zero, again, zero point, uh, still 3% or so, you know, 3.35, 3 depending on uh, how you look at it. Uh, but still, we, great effort is still needed, uh, so we're glad to uh, see what God is doing. We are excited to be there. Uh, just quick introduce, uh, introduction about myself. I'm, um, I'm African-born, European-raised, Korean, naturalized in the States, living abroad in Indonesia for almost 20 years. So I guess I'm Eurafro-Asian American. Uh, <laughs> And my family, uh, I was born in Africa, my wife was born in Korea, my eldest was born in uh, the States, the, the youngest was born in Indonesia, so again, we are a very international family in that sense. Uh, but one thing that holds us together is that we are citizens of heaven. You know, I think that's where, we, where our home is, that's where we're going to find our identity, uh, not um, where I'm from or where I was born but really where I am going. And I think that uh, holds the family together as well. Um, so yes, in the back there's, uh, uh, you know, I'll, on the way out we can, you know, greet my family. They are with us, uh, with me. So um, with, before, uh, without further ado, we'll uh, start with the, uh, the word and then we'll start. Okay, uh, the, today's message comes from uh, Jeremiah 9, 20 through, uh, 23 through 24. Uh, I'll be reading out of ESV version. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, declares the Lord. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask you Give us wisdom to understand your word, to understand you, and to understand that, you, that you're God who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. And in our hopes, in our want to please you, that we might correctly understand and carry out your teachings in our lives. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. What image comes to your mind if you hear the word justice? Some of you might have imagined Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and the gang, right? Or some of you might have thought of the blind, uh, blindfolded Lady Justice with uh, the, 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 the scale on one hand with the, the sword on the other. Or some people might have even thought of um, some of the protests on the streets 
in recent years calling out for justice. Could be many things, but, um, but there's one thing that probably have in common and that's, that all sort of relates to its sort of action and reaction against something, whether it be supervillains or whether it's a wrong done to a person or wrong done to the system or whatever it be. And how do we get to this understanding? And I think it is important to understand that, like the way we understand the word justice and righteousness today, we owe it a lot to the Greeks and the Latin concept of what justice and uh, righteousness are. The Greek and the Roman society relied strongly on the government and they had laws under it, and especially the Latin, the, the, the Roman society, right? And if you were judged unright, if you're judged uh, of doing wrong, then you are punished by the law in order to keep the society going. But when we look at um, the Semitic society or, you know, society like the, the Israelites, a lot, a lot of times it's actually the, the concept of justice and righteousness has slightly different take. It is more... Uh, in the light of restorative relational, when relationships are broken, then injustice has been done. In the Old Testament writing, justice and righteous, uh, righteousness, two words, often goes hand in hand and goes together. It appears together a lot. The Hebrew word for justice, misfat, could be used for, again, paying for the crime committed. So. Again, it's not too far from the justice we understand, but more often than not, it's been used in the sense of uh, call people to restore other people, has been um, to elevate those who are uh, uh, suffering or, or who has been done wrong. Okay. Um, where justice call people to elevate those who are marginalized, but make effort in changing the social structure to fight against that system that it binds people. And the word for righteousness, um, sadaka, or where uh, it really has to do with giving of alms, doing the, uh, the good deeds. Uh, it has a deeper meaning of doing good. It is the relational, relational goodness. Okay. And to others and also to the law. And understanding that, I think, in the context of the scripture today, it helps us to understand justice, not because the way we understand justice in, in this society, in, in the context of Greek and the, 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 with the uh, Roman understanding, justice is you did a crime, you pay for your uh, it is your right or wrong. Whereas justice in the context of how it has been used in the time of the Bible is, is more of um, justice of restorative justice. What is, has been broken? Because if I sin against someone, if I do wrong against society or someone, that relationship has been broken and has to be restored. So it focuses more on the restoration of it. And why is this important for us to understand it in this context? Because biblical understanding of justice and righteousness, understanding it in, 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 in context of that is because we are created people in the image of God, imago Dei. Okay, we're created in the image of God. So when that is broken through sin, or disbelief, there is that, that urging for us to restore that. There is a calling for us to restore that. In 1 John 4, uh, 7 through 10, the Bible says, Beloved, 
Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made, uh, made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that he might live through him, uh, that we might live through him. In, uh, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the pro- uh, appropriation for our sins. So image of God in the restoration that Jesus came for us. And because of that, because why? And it is because God is love. And understanding the Trinity is like he's bound. The very thing that binds God is love. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's inseparable because of love. And you cannot separate that. And because of that love and his love for the people, his creation, he has sent Jesus Christ for us. And as his people redeemed, we are called to carry out the restorative, restorative justice and righteousness that's aimed to build up people that are hurt marginalized, to tear down the system that oppress us, maybe the system within us or the way we think that further marginalize people. And we can see God's plan in Jesus in this. In Matthew 12, Jesus quotes Isaiah in how he he is, to, he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. In Matthew 12, 18 through 21, it reads, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. We will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. In the smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his, in his name, the Gentiles will hope. The consequences of man's sin is to be judged, but God's nature of love had to be reconciled at the same time. And Jesus came to satisfy both God's wrath and his love, his judgment and rest, restoration. And he does it perfectly. Jesus modeled for us the perfect way to, and, um, call, and calls uh, his followers to walk in his ways, in justice and righteousness, in love and mercy. As followers of Jesus, we are called to restore shalom, God's original creation, the peace, the the way it should be. As a risen king, he tell you know we can read about in understanding of Jesus as a risen king who's over us. We can uh, understand it deeply in Isaiah sixteen five. It reads, Then a throne will be established in the steadfast love, and on it will sit a faithless, uh, faith, uh, in it faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and a swift to do righteousness. In Psalm 89, 14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Again, the way he rules, and he rules over us, thus we are called to faithfulness and love. But this carrying this justice and righteousness, it will cost you. It doesn't come cheap. Just as Christ's grace that he has given us didn't come cheap. 
because we're the recipient of that grace, carrying this out will cost you, cost us. The society's cor uh, corrupted definition of justice and righteousness long, no longer fits our bill anymore. In, in light of gospel, it, we cannot just take it, no, he's wrong, he has to go to jail, and forget it. We can't just stop at there. Yes, there's a system, so you, you, you upkeep the law and all that, yes. But we can't just say, nope, we condemn you. It no longer should sit right with us. There is that, that, that yearning to see the restoration happen. It has to be. If, if grace and love and, and, and redemption that we have received, if this is alive, there should be something stirring, seeing, you know what, this is not right. Acts 4, uh, 32 through 35. Now the full number of those who believed were in one heart and soul, and no one said that any of, of the things they belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Uh, upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of land or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and was distributed to each as they had need. Again, this is an extreme example of community. But they couldn't sit and see people in need, people who are suffering. They had to re restore their relationship. It was just, they were working powerfully within, when they received the gospel. The New Testament illustrates how many, so how many cases of how the new paradigm of justice exampled by Christ have changed how the church dealt with justice and righteousness in love and in mercy as they were committed by committed to the fact that people are made in the image of God. They had to embrace communion with Samaritans and Gentiles. The, co the community had to value the women, widows, orphans the same way also. The slaves and the free had equal footing in the community of Christ. And let me end with this parable that we all know very well. It comes from Luke 10, 25 through 37, and it's the parable of Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love your God, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho he fell among the robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, passed on on the other side. So likewise, a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he, was journeyed, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil on oil and wine. Wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, "Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will 
repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed, mer showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The expert on the law came to Jesus and asked about, how do you inherit eternal life? <clears throat> and Jesus pretty much asked him to answer his own question. And the lawyer proceeded to answer him with a answer that was where every Israelites knew how to answer. Based on it was based in Deuteronomy six, and that is bound to the hands and the head. It's written on, it's, it's the practice of binding your word to the hand and the forehead. It's in the doorpost. So it was very familiar to him. And then he goes, um, then he goes on to ask Jesus who his neighbors were. Who is my neighbor? And then he tells the parable. And when the, pre the guy was beaten up, stripped, left to die, and the priests and Levites carry out justice and righteousness through the outlook of the law. Priests, by, by, by the law, they could not touch a dead person. For they themselves would they be defiled. He's unclean to carry out his priestly duties. So what does he do? And of course, the guy is stripped naked, just the loincloth. So by the way he's dressed, there is no way to know if he's Jewish or Samaritan or Gentile. So if he, if he had a, a bacon, he would be unclean. Therefore, I will be defined if it was a Gentile. So what do they do? They cross on the other side, making sure that they are well distanced from defiling themselves. By the law prescribed to them. But Jesus always teaches us to think deeper. <laughs> then comes Samaritan who saw the wounded man and carries out justice and righteousness in love. He stops at the very place where robbers could be still around. He cleans the wound, so he's probably going out to sell things, right? So he has bets that he move on, but he doesn't. He finds compassion. He stops, dresses his wounds, pour oil and uh, vinegar, or oil and, 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 and wine to sterilize and to clean up his wounds, gets him on his donkey and goes back and takes him to the inn and takes care of him. And the next day, he goes to the innkeeper, here's the money, take care of him. And when I come back, if I, you needed to have, if he actually owes more money, I'll come and settle that up. Even looking into, because if the guy, the guy who was ill, the two denarii, if the two denarii didn't cover the cost of him getting well, he would, he doesn't have money, therefore he would be indentured to pay that off. So he doesn't just take care of his need who was beaten up, but he even looks forward that he's not bound, he's not in bondage of debt to the innkeeper. So he's carrying out justice. He's thinking of restoration, restoring this man back to his family. Jesus then asked the expert of the law, who was the neighbor to the man hurt in the circumstance? 
then he tells the lawyer to go and do likewise, which is very, for lawyer hearing this, the expert of the law hearing this, it will sound a little raw because it's like, go and be like the Samaritan. Go and restore. But that, I think we have also, many times listening to the story, we learn to just kind of judge, oh, the priest, the Samaritan, the, the Levites. But we are, but it's calling us, like, do you have the same judgment in your heart? Or do you view law in a way that is different from the grace and the love, the restorative justice that God is calling us to do? Um, yeah, but we are all in, in um, so I was very, it, 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 um, the whole thing of being like, being a good neighbor, it, it struck me to, to say, yeah, this is, it is about restoration. We are, we are witness, we are well aware of society's treating and treating the hurting, uh, the way society has been treating the hurting, the marginalized people, and people who are outsiders. And please do not take it as, as a rant and nitpicking, but rather a challenge that, that God has given us to see if there are any blind, blind sides in our lives or any plank in our eyes as we live our lives in a just and righteous way. And our challenge is this. How do you read justice and righteousness in your life? How do you read righteousness justice in your life and in our pursuit of justice motive is our pursuit of justice motivated by love what are some of the blinders or planks in our eyes what are some of the blinders we have what are some of the planks that we have in our own eyes and finally how are we reclaiming Imago Dei, image of God in other people? How are we restoring that image of God in other people? Let us pray. Oh God, we...